I'd like to um, introduce our next um, speaker who's been a huge supporter of SWAN um, along our journey, um, Associate Professor Tracy dudding -Bythe. Um, Trace is a full-time consultant, clinical geneticist and director of the New South Wales Genetics of Learning Disability Gold Service. Her clinical and research interests include, uh, and I'm going to pronounce it wrong, neurofibromatosis type 1, otherwise known as NF1, which I think is much easier to say, and the genetics of intellectual disability and rare disease. One of the challenges faced by rare disease researchers is the identification of individuals or families around the world with the same rare condition or clinical phenotype. Um, at as 50% of children with moderate intellectual disability have facial features which provide a clue to diagnosis. Tracy leads the innovative Face Match project. This initiative uses 2D facial recognition technology for matching the facial um, features of individuals. Um, who are known to have um, have an unknown syndromic forms of intellectual disability. And Tracy will um, explain a little bit more about face match and how it works in her presentation. She also leads the MRFF funded NF1 um, Research Consortium and is honoured to sit on the Medical Advisory Committee of the Steve Wall Foundation, an Australian charity for children with rare disease. So I will pass over to Tracy and she will um, share her presentation and I look forward to hearing it. Thanks, Tracy. Thanks, um, look, before I start, I just wanted to say that I really enjoyed all today's presentations and to hear about Madeline and Naomi and Carter. Um, was really special and I just wanted to thank people for um, sharing their stories with me as a clinical geneticist. They are the stories that we hear every day from our patients, which are very heartbreaking. And I think as a clinical geneticist, we find it incredibly challenging when we're unable to provide a diagnosis for our families. But let me just start. So my name is Tracy Dunning bike I am a clinical geneticist and I lead the, I'm the director of the New South Wales Genetics of Learning Disability Service. I have a child with a rare disease, but I was a geneticist before I had my child. And at six months, I realised that there was the Grace had a problem. So it took me as a clinical geneticist four years to convince anybody else. And I actually knew what her diagnosis was at six months. So this really made me... I have a personal understanding of this whole diagnostic journey and the grief, the chronic grief that goes with that and the uncertainty. And so it really made me very interested um, coming from the perspective of the parent, but also a clinician. And, and I've been working strongly uh, on patient advocacy and working with Minister Hunt on the National Air Disease Framework over the last 10 years. So thank you, Heather, for the opportunity to talk today. Um, and I wanted to talk about the advances in genetic diagnosis for children with intellectual disability to get an idea of where we've come, but what the challenges are and what the future holds. And I just wanted to confirm that I have um, permission to use these photographs. So this is Charlie and her mother, Ainsley. Charlie is one of my patients and she has a complex medical history, including severe intellectual disability and feeding problems. And Charlie remains undiagnosed. And I don't really need to tell you because we've already heard today from the other parents that we can't underestimate the value of a diagnosis. So a diagnosis provides an answer, potentially provides information about the future, can restore confidence around having other children and reduces that sense of isolation. And I remember someone asking me once, well, why do you need a diagnosis when there's no treatment? And I think really we're in the dark ages compared to a lot of conditions because most of our patients um, don't get a diagnosis, let alone a treatment. Although these conditions are individually rare, together they inform our understanding of the complex biological pathways involved in brain growth and function. And hopefully this will one day lead to available treatment. So a diagnosis is the first step to eventually having um, targeted treatments for these rare conditions. So I'll discuss the history of genetic diagnosis, which I've been working as a geneticist for 20 years. So I've been um, lucky to have seen the advances uh, during my clinical practice. We'll talk about whole exome sequencing and the challenges with whole exome sequencing. And we'll talk about the face match project. 
And it was really patients like Charlie that inspired me to undertake this really challenging and difficult project, which I'll talk to you a bit more about. So we know that around 50% of children who have a moderate to severe intellectual disability will have facial features providing a clue to diagnosis. And the word syndrome, I think, has lots of stigma around it, but it really means a collection of features that occur together in a recognisable fashion. So not all children with the syndrome have intellectual disabilities, so it's Marfan syndrome and other conditions. But the initially in genetics, this ability to recognise a face was um, to look at your children, child's, or look at the patient's face and compare them with other conditions in the literature was really central to how we made a diagnosis before genetic testing. So prior to mapping the human genome, a condition was initially described by a doctor or a collection of doctors, and they recognised a group of their patients shared similar facial features. And usually the children with the more severe end of the spectrum were the first described. And early as a geneticist, before the availability of genetic testing, it was a clinical diagnosis by comparing a child's face or features with other children in the medical literature that allowed us to provide parents with information about prognosis, but about recurrence risk in subsequent pregnancy. So these boys have a condition called Coffin, um, um, Coffin Larry syndrome, which is X-linked, which means the mum has, um, with every boy, there's a one in two chance of the boy being affected. The mapping of the human genome in 2003 really changed our practice of medical clinical genetics. We learned that we have 3.3 uh, billion letters of DNA code in our genome, and we have a copy of our genome in every cell of our body. Our genome contains 20 to 25,000 genes, which provide the instructions or codes for the cells to make the proteins needed in normal body structure and function. However, our genes only account for 1% of the genome. And it's this 1% which contains our 20 to 25,000 genes that's called the exome. And it contains about 3 million nucleotides. So the whole genome is 3.3 billion, but the exome, which is what we're testing when we do whole exome sequencing, is testing the actual coding genes, and they have 30 million nucleotides. So when the genome was first discovered, by comparing the DNA of children who had these recognisable conditions, uh, genes responsible for these conditions were discovered. And then what we found is that different genes coding for proteins within the same biological pathway actually cause similar features. So for example, children presenting with Cornelia de Lange syndrome can be due to changes in a number of different genes, but all these genes are in the same pathway. So before high throughput sequencing, for several years, we could only offer single gene testing. So I remember we had some testing available, but a patient would need to come in, we'd need to look at their face, look at their features and decide which one gene we were going to test because each gene test cost about $2,000. So a doctor would need to recognize that this child here has mild um, rubenstein tabi syndrome, otherwise they wouldn't make the diagnosis. So it was quite challenging. And back then our diagnostic rate around the world was about 10%. The introduction of a new technology about five years ago called Massively Parallel Sequencing now allows us to simultaneously test all the 1500 developmental disorder genes in a single test for a cost around $1,000. So you can imagine as a geneticist, I went, wow, I'm gonna get a diagnosis for all my patients. And it was such an exciting time to be able to um, help our patients. So using this technology, the diagnostic rate increased from 10% now to around 30 to 50%. So that was huge. So this is for patients with a moderate to severe or profound intellectual disability. The, the rate is probably closer to 30%, although some, some centres will say 50%, but they've really based it on very select patients. But if you look at all patients with moderate to severe intellectual disability, it's around a 30% diagnostic rate. And also, 
there was a rapid increase in gene discovery because if they found people who looked similar, they could compare their DNA and discover new genes. So it's been a very exciting time over the last few years as a clinical geneticist. There's now a Medicare rebate for paediatricians so that paediatricians can order exome sequencing for patients under the age of 10 who meet the following criteria. So the child needs to have a moderate developmental delay or a moderate intellectual disability, or if the doctor thinks they've got some dysmorphic facial features and at least one other major or congenital abnormality. Now, the Gold Service has been working with paediatricians in New South Wales because we have been having trouble getting paediatricians to order this test because there's lots of reasons or barriers to that. They, it's a time barrier, it's an understanding barrier. Um, they feel that they can't interpret this test. So last year when in New South Wales, we should have had 700 exomes ordered by paediatricians, we had about 48, but our service is working on the intervention plan to try and improve ordering by um, paediatricians. So when the laboratory is trying to uh, interpret this exome data, we know that an individual's exome is sequenced. It will differ from each other and the reference uh, exome by around 20,000 variants or changes in DNA code. And if we actually can sequence the genome, we're actually differing from 3 million variants. And most of these changes are, are actually part of our normal variation and don't cause disease. So we've all got lots of changes in our DNA code, but most of them don't cause a problem. So the rate limiting step now is not sequencing the DNA, but interpreting what these changes in the DNA mean. The laboratory uses a combination of information to classify a variant as benign, i.e. part of our normal variation, or pathogenic, causing a genetic condition. Unfortunately, about 30% of reports have what's called a variant of uncertain significance or a VUS. And that means there's insufficient data to say whether it's benign or pathogenic. Sometimes additional information can help. Um, so the patient's clinical features might match um, other people who have um, a, chain, a pathogenic change in the gene um, or, or following the gene change through the family can reclassify. So we have moved from a sort of a phenotype where we'd look at the patient's clinical features to a genotype first approach where we do the genetic testing first and then go back and have a look at the patient. But what we know is that the clinical assessment is still really important. It's important to determine does the genetic test actually result match with the patient's clinical features and it helps interpret the vast amount of variants that are, that are found in the DNA. So what a patient looks like and what their clinical features are is really important in looking at the DNA. Although high resolution sequencing has revolutionized clinical diagnosis, the technology does bring a number of new challenges. One of the main bottlenecks is just this vast amount of DNA sequencing data. And that's a problem when we're testing our 1% of the genome, which is the genes. But when we test the whole genome, which is um, the 3.3 billion letters in the uh, DNA code, it's obviously going to be even more challenging. And what was disappointing for us as geneticists is that 50 to 70% of our patients who we thought we'd find a diagnosis still remain undiagnosed despite this new technology. So it's been great, and many people have a diagnosis, but we've still got most people who remain undiagnosed. And there are thought to be around 2000 developmental disorder genes still to be characterized. There's lots, lots to learn. So maybe one day we will have an answer for Madeline um, and, we, um, and everyone will keep looking. And I think as a, doc, as a geneticist, that's what we do. We just keep looking. Um, to try and find the answer for your patient. And I think, you know, sometimes I'll find a, a, a diagnosis after 10 years. So why is making a diagnosis still so challenging? Well, remember I said that although 20,000 genes have been mapped, we don't know what 70% of them do. So when we're looking at the exome, we're not actually looking at 20,000 genes, we're actually looking at about 5,000. And again, there's still about, about 
um, 2,000 developmental disorder genes still to be characterised. So as new genes are discovered, they will then be part of the exome and then more children will be diagnosed with those particular conditions. The other problem is that our ability to interpret variants in the non-coding or regulatory DNA is very limited. I remember when this part of the DNA was called junk because no one knew what it did, but we know it's incredibly important and it regulates our 20,000 genes. A mouse and a banana also have around 20,000 genes. But the main difference is the organism becomes more complex as we get more non-coding DNA. So it's possible that our undiagnosed patients might have changes in the non-coding or regulatory DNA that's affecting one of the genes. As a doctor, I feel a sense of frustration and helplessness when I cannot help parents find a diagnosis. As I said, I keep looking and I enrol patients into research um, and try to access new genetic technology. But there is hope for the future. And I'll just talk about, there's lots of new things coming, but I'll just talk about two new um, emerging technologies. So whole, whole genome sequencing is available, but it's still difficult to interpret and it's expensive. So most of the time, so a Medicare rebate is, is really just for exome sequencing. But what we know is that recording the features of a child will be really important when we're looking at whole genome sequencing. Because if a child looks like they've got Kabuki syndrome, but they don't have a change in the Kabuki syndrome gene, we're then looking at parts of the non-coding DNA that might actually be affecting that gene. So the phenotype or the clinical features will be important moving forward. RNA sequencing quantifies the expression level of all genes at once. So it's looking at which genes are producing a protein and which genes are not. This is complex and expensive. And again, phenotyping will be important. This is not available clinically, but um, in the Gold Service, we have um, research collaborations where we can offer this to some of our patients. As I mentioned before, we know that Phenotyping, which is looking at clinical features, is important in the discovery of new genes. And it's going to be particularly important when we're looking at the non-coding DNA and gene expression profiles. These two patients were presented at a medical conference and the two doctors in the audience realised that they had patients who looked similar. So they went down and compared their DNA and they found that they both carried a pathogenic change in a gene called PAX1. So once that condition is described, it's then in the medical literature and that gene is then looked at by the lab where before it was a gene of unknown function. And then now since then, hundreds more children with PAX1 have been described. At the moment, when, doctor, when a patient remains undiagnosed, the clinicians rely on manual face matching techniques. So they have to try and remember, do they have a patient who looks similar? We actually meet four times a year and we present our undiagnosed patients to each other with consent, saying, you know, do you have a patient who looks like this? Or we enter written descriptions into phenotyping databases. These processes are slow, subjective and inefficient and lacking in reliability. And although doctors are quite good at recognising, uh, I suppose, describing or recognising a known condition, they're not very good at describing accurately in a written form what a face looks like. And so we're quite subjective and prone to error when it comes to describing what a face looks like. After learning about the work of Professor Brian Lovell, who's the Professor of Engineering and IT at Queensland University, I wondered whether facial recognition technology that was developed for CCTV could be used to match the faces of children who remain undiagnosed following exome sequencing. This technology was ideally suited for the clinic setting because it doesn't require a front-on passport like photo because it was developed for CCTV. So it doesn't require perfect frontal orientation. We undertook a pilot study with just over 3,000 images, including 10 syndromes, where we took a photo out and then put it back in to see whether it would match with a non-identical individual within the same syndrome group. We're not making an average face. What we're doing is looking to see, is there someone in the database who looks like the particular patient? And we're able to make that match within milliseconds. And you can see from this image here that the, um, the data, the, these boys were matched as a number one match 
uh, out of 3,000 images where they were just matched through serendipity before having been presented at the same meeting um, in the US. The pilot study confirmed that the technology was highly accurate, matching within the same syndrome subgroup. During the pilot study, we usually only had one image per, per person. However, we did have a number of images of um, this one girl here in the yellow box who has cool and debris. Interestingly, what we found is that as a baby, she matched with four other children, different children with cool and debris with the top 10 out of 3,000 images. As a toddler, she matched with different children with cool and debris. And as an adolescent, she matched again with different children with cool and debris. It made me realise that it's important to collect multiple images across the age spectrum if we're looking to find children who have similar facial features. So at that stage, to explore the clinical utility of this face matching technology on a larger scale, we developed the International Face Match Recruitment Platform. This first of its kind platform was awarded a 2021 Research Australia Health and Medical Research Innovation Award in the category of innovative data. The site allows both parents and doctors around the world to contribute to a secure image database accompanied by variant data and clinical features for both children and adults. We are recruiting patients who are diagnosed and undiagnosed following exome sequencing or genome sequencing. We've completed a usability and acceptability study and have been starting to recruit internationally for health professionals and families. The types of patients that come into face match are patients who have a VUS and a known gene. So a match with a person with a pathogenic variant might help triage to further research. A patient who remains negative following exome sequencing because we're trying to uh, make a facial match with another person who's undiagnosed to facilitate novel ID gene discovery. And patients with a confirmed genetic diagnosis. So parents are able to provide photos of the child with a confirmed diagnosis. So that can help us with um, the first two groups of patients. Parents can register themselves or be directed to the site by a doctor, either by email or a brochure. Therefore, enrolment of the project can be initiated by a parent or a health professional. And I think for me, and I was probably correct in saying that, is I thought I would get more uh, parents interested in the project than doctors, which has been the case. I've had lots of problems getting doctors interested in the project because they quote themselves as being too busy, already working 70 hours a week. But I have had lots of parents come into the project. So... Once registered, a parent can go to an online consent and upload photos and results. If the child is undiagnosed, they do need to nominate a doctor. So they need to have a departmental email address for their doctor. And what I find is that if the doctor receives an invitation from the parent, they usually do complete the enrolment. And if they don't, I can actually complete the enrolment on behalf if, if the doctor doesn't. But it's good to have the doctor involved because this allows us to work with the doctor for undiagnosed patients. And as I said, parents of um, children with a diagnosed condition can contribute. They don't need to nominate a doctor. They can just go up and upload their images, do the consent, upload images, and but they do need to provide a copy of the of their genetic test result because we that's so that we can curate all the information. And parents around the world, we've had about four hundred parents around the world who have uploaded just to help us build this database. Once, this is the, once the doctors are registered, they can um, enrol a, a patient, they can send them an email, or they can give them a brochure. So if a doctor gives you a brochure, the brochure allows you to, takes you to a QR code where you can read about the project before deciding to consent, and it links you with, the, with, the, um, with your doctor. We have been encouraging, so we report back to doctors if there's a successful match. We've been encouraging doctors to consent at time of exome sequencing, but again, the uptake has been a little bit less than what we were hoping for. We can undertake a match on diagnosed patients, and we report that back to the doctors, who then report that back to the patients. 
Currently, we're continuing to develop our database. We have around 6,000 images and curated DNA, and it continues to grow every day. We're doing projects looking at optimising the current algorithm. We will be doing a project looking at how the data, how the system compares with a clinical geneticist and a paediatrician. And Basematch has been accepted as a node within the Matchmaker Exchange. So the Matchmaker Exchange is very important to clinical geneticists as because if they have um, a patient who has a negative exome, but there's a change in what we call a candidate gene, so it's one of those genes of unknown function, they put that candidate gene into Matchmaker and it links up with all these siloed researchers around the world. And if another doctor somewhere has a patient with a change in the same gene, it sort of pings you and then you can contact the other doctor and you can say, well, does your patient look like mine? What sort of features? And that's how new genes are discovered. But face match will be the first node to match on facial features as well as genetic data. And we're hoping that that will be up in the next few months. So thank you for your time today. This has been an ambitious project, but I, I still believe in the project despite how difficult it's been to engage clinical geneticists in the project. And I believe that together with parents, we can improve the diagnostic rate for, parent, for children with syndromic intellectual disability who remain unresolved following exome or genome sequencing. And I was completely thrilled to receive the Research Australia Health and Medical Research Award because it just made me realise that it's a good idea <laughs> and it's worthwhile and that we need to keep moving um, forward with this. Thank you for your time today.